Gathered friends, listen again to our legend of the Bionicle. Devoted fans of the LEGO group are likely familiar with their Bionicle product line, the first of LEGO's first-party, story-driven intellectual properties, and one that, without which the LEGO group may not even exist today. Now, I say likely familiar only to be polite, because you'd literally have to have lived under a rock or have been born sometime since 2010 to have any excuse not to know about Bionicle in even the smallest way. And even at that, the line got rebooted in 2015 for a second generation, so if all this is totally unfamiliar to you, let's sit down sometime and I'll get you up to speed. Bionicle was the LEGO Group's response, in part, to the Pokémon series, which, according to LEGO's internal reports from 1998 and 1999, had made a sizable dent in LEGO's market share of worldwide toy sales. Having cut 1,500 jobs during 98 and 99, and still dancing on the edge of bankruptcy in early 2000, Bionicle was lightning in a bottle for the LEGO Group. Its success was so vast and so immediate that for all intents and purposes, it single-handedly brought the company back from the brink of financial collapse. LEGO Star Wars and LEGO Harry Potter certainly played their part, but the effect of Bionicle's success on the LEGO Group's current standing as an international toy maker cannot be overstated. The success of the product line was due not only to the novelty and design of the toys themselves, being part of what would soon be called Constraction Toys, a new taxonomy to distinguish LEGO's constructible action figures, hence Constraction, from more traditional forms like G.I. Joe, but also because of the strong multimedia tie-ins the LEGO Group released in conjunction with the physical toys. This involved comics, books, movies, shoes, and video games, the latter of which involved the now somewhat infamously cancelled PC game called called Lego Bionicle The Legend of Metanui, and due to Legend's cancellation, the now even more famous Metanui Online Game, a Flash-based browser game from New York-based developers Templar Games, known then as Templar Studios. And it is this masterpiece of Flash gaming that we'll be talking about today. My first experience with Matanui Online Game was at age 9 on a computer at a local library, because the computers at the library had better internet speeds than what we had at home. And it was a transcendent experience. It was by no means the first video game I'd ever played, but it was the first time I realized that games could be art. Sure, I didn't think of it in those terms as a nine-year-old, but in looking back on those memories of Matanui, I know that was the moment when games became something more to me. Now here in 2020, as Flash grows closer and closer to the end of its very long life, I decided to hit the web and see what I could dig up on my favorite Flash game of all time. Making these videos for Subpixel has sent me down some pretty interesting internet rabbit holes the past few years, and this was no different. I first discovered that Templar Games have a number of Metanui Online Game post-mortem developer diaries up on their Tumblr account, which are immensely fascinating to sift through if you get the chance. But I wanted more and Templar's general inquiry address seemed like a good place to start. Now, I was met with a response from none other than the president of Templar Games, Peter Mack, who provided me with some remarkable insight into the development of the Matanui Online game. So here is, from the developers themselves, an oral history of the Matanui Online game. Our story begins not with the Matanui Online game itself, but with a different game Templar developed for the LEGO Group for their Mindstorms product line, a game called Stormrunner. Also developed in Flash, Stormrunner was Templar's ticket into, as Mac put it in our email exchange, the ultra-secret product and story development process for Bionicle. In late 1999, as development for Stormrunner drew near its end, LEGO approached Templar to develop something for the new line, though at that point it wasn't certain if it would be a game, a website, or something else entirely. As I mentioned earlier, Bionicle as a toy and as an intellectual property was entirely new territory for the LEGO group, so much of the marketing was still uncertain in the early days of the project. 
It was during this period that Mac recalled trips to Copenhagen and Billund for the initial sales meetings, at which time he was introduced to a variety of marketing materials already assembled by the LEGO Group and its various third-party contractors. Among these materials was a vast story bible, which according to Mac was still being revised at the time, and a design document that had been assembled by Danish creative agency Advance, which included 3D key art that would eventually go on to be used on the packaging for Bionicle's many sets, and concept art for the island of Matanui and a handful of the island's locales. These meetings continued back on the other side of the Atlantic with a meeting at the Grand Hyatt in New York City on July 7, 2000. Then in August, a year before Bionicle's physical sets would appear on North American store shelves, Templar presented to LEGO their idea for, in Max words, a mist-style adventure set on the island of Matanui. And finally, in a letter of intent from the LEGO Group dated September 14, 2000, Templar, working from an exhaustive story bible assembled in various parts by former LEGO head of character and story development Bob Thompson and BAFTA-nominated writer Alastair Swinnerton, who was working with a team of writers at Scriptonite, a UK-based script services company, Templar set about creating the world of Matanui. But if it has not yet become obvious, Matanui Online Game was not originally developed with the knowledge that it would essentially become the de facto storyline for Bionicle in 2001. In fact, the team at Templar often felt like they were an afterthought amidst the greater Bionicle marketing push. Max said that Templar's mission at the time was to communicate the world of Matanui, though he assumed LEGO would have likely accepted, in his words, a trivia game or a nicely illustrated wiki. The broad strokes of the Bionicle storyline had already been planned out, going as far as seven years into the future of the canon, but it was the day-to-day goings-on of the island that were still uncertain. And it was that uncertainty that Templar intended to clarify. Though for whatever vague assignments the team at Templar had been given, the broad strokes nature of the Bionicle story bible showed that the primary adventures of the Toa had already been definitively planned out for other media, and as such were off-limits to the team at Templar. They would need to tell a story with the leftovers, with characters Mac called misfits and comic relief characters that were, at best, footnotes in the style guide. And not only were the few characters Templar had at their disposal secondary to the primary events of the Greater Bionicle Saga, they weren't even part of the main toy line, but promotional figures that came with McDonald's Happy Meals. But even with these restrictions, former LEGO Group creative director Russell Stoll was convinced that Templar could make something great, and pushed for Matanui Online Game to have a greater role in the storytelling of Bionicle's early narrative. Stoll was in charge of online community development for LEGO.com in the late 90s and early 2000s, and according to Templar's Tumblr diaries had convinced LEGO to let Matanui Online essentially launch the story of Bionicle, and then let the aforementioned PC game, movie, and comics pick up the narrative down the line. In our emails, Mac recalled a strategy document dated in 2000 that laid out LEGO's plans for storytelling in the Bionicle universe. Six boxes representing the six chapters of the Legend of Metanui PC game, and each of the Toa's primary adventures on the island, served as the backbone for a chart breaking down the story. With these boxes encased in dotted lines that represented the Bionicle website with its additional storytelling from Templar, as yet still undefined in the greater canon. But it's the absence of something in the strategy document that is most interesting within our tale. According to Mac, the Bionicle comics are conspicuously absent from this 2000 strategy document. The lack of emphasis on the comics and the abundance of emphasis on the PC title shows that, at least in 2000, LEGO had every intention of letting the legend of Matanui do the brunt of Bionicle's narrative development once the line really kicked off. Matanui Online Game would still be just a prelude, at least for now. But the aforementioned and now infamous cancellation of The Legend of Metanui would change all that. I couldn't track down much by way of LEGO's official stance on the matter beyond communication between Bionicle fansite MaskOfDestiny.com and a LEGO spokesperson that, in a post from Mask of Destiny user Purple Dave, is only mentioned as Michael. The post claims that, amongst other things, LEGO was concerned about chip compatibility and the timing of the game's release, and as such pulled the plug. Now, there are other potentially more relevant details we could get into here. Legend of Metanui developer Sapphire Inc.'s at the time unstable financial situation, chief among them, but all that is tangential to the one point we really need to know for the sake of Metanui online game. Legend of Metanui was cancelled. And though the cancellation occurred definitively in October of 2001, well after the first of Templar's Metanui online programs went up on Bionicle.com, its cancellation presented a unique opportunity for Templar to end their own game with with a greater narrative impact than previously thought. Mac recalled that he and the team at Templar were shocked by the news of Legends cancellation, but now we're getting ahead of ourselves. 
Let's rewind back to pre-production for Metanui Online Game. In developing the world of Matanui, Templar found more problems beyond just the lack of fully fleshed characters at their disposal. The Bionicle brand posed other narrative issues for the team at Templar, but unlike the issue of characters, these weren't problems inherent to the Bionicle IP itself, but problems more related to how the property fit within the LEGO Group's company philosophies. For decades, LEGO had striven to be a company about creativity and play, not violence. Even the name, Lego, is derived from the Danish words for play well. So what was Lego to do with Bionicle, where the main characters had sharp axes, flaming swords, and piercing hooks and claws? And how was Templar to tell a story of good versus evil without the use of violence? Mac recalled two competing camps within the Lego group. The product team, the ones actually designing the physical sets, obviously had no problem with it. Or at the very least, the idea of it, when they gave their heroes swords, axes, and other dangerous implements. But the hesitance of the Bionicle hero's aggressive appearance came from the marketing team, who were hoping to hold on to Lego's as yet untarnished identity as an educational, non-violent family brand. Eventually, word came from the marketing team in Denmark, a compromise of sorts. The Toa did not have weapons, they had tools. But this too presented new problems for the team at Templar, namely combat within the game's animated cutscenes. Mac put it this way, it was not that easy from a story standpoint, and art-wise it called for more elaborate demises than simply lopping someone in half with an axe. Nevertheless, we got it. Our action sequences were full of daring escapes, cave-ins, collapsing bridges, or just dodged boulders. When someone needed to blast a Rahi, they blasted instead the rocks in the cave above their head. No Rahi were outright stabbed in the making of the game. Buried alive, maybe. And if a tool did find its mark, it did so off-screen. Now, while we're talking about Matanui's cutscenes, this is probably a good time to talk about Matanui Online Game on an aesthetic level. Typically, the phrase Flash Game doesn't bring to mind any sort of overly artistic endeavor, but I hope to change that conception with this video. Matanui Online Game was boundary-pushing when it came out. In my emails with Mac, I asked if Matanui's stylized, almost Miyazaki-esque art style was a deliberate decision or one that had been necessitated by the limits of Flash at the time. Mac said it was a little bit of both. Gordon Climes, Templar Games' creative director and assistant director on Matanui Online Games, spearheaded the artistic push. According to Mac, Climes was responsible for setting the artistic tone of Matanui Online Game. But again, we're getting just a little bit ahead of ourselves. The roots of Matanui's artistic stylings can be seen in the short flash cutscenes Templar had made for Stormrunner. Max said these animations were built in Java with an HTML shell, which is beyond the scope of my limited knowledge of game development, but I wanted to at least include the specifics here for those of you who may enjoy that kind of minutia. So with Stormrunner in the books, it was time to move on to Bionicle and whatever form its website might take. The LEGO toyed with the idea of just hosting still images on the site, it was decided that animation would have some sort of presence. Knowing that LEGO had been satisfied with the quality of Flash animation Templar had been able to achieve with Stormrunner, Mac and company set about developing the look and style of what would become Matanui Online Games' animated cutscenes. However, there was some skepticism from higher up the chain of command that Templar could get Flash to really do the Matanui animations justice. Now, Matt confided that at least for the first couple programs, the skeptics at LEGO may have been right. But as the team got more comfortable with the software and their own processes, they were able to deliver scenes that in their minds, and in the minds of fans playing the game, looked pretty good, especially for something delivered over a modem. Now, re-watching all these cutscenes in preparation for writing this script, I found myself stunned not only by the art, but also the economy of animation. Templar, given the lemons they had to work with, really made lemonade. Just look at this fight between Liwa and Onua. The way the battle is hidden in darkness and represented with weapon streaks is such a simple and elegant way to not only show the ferocity of the battle, but also get around the aforementioned moratorium on direct weapon on person contact that had been mandated by the LEGO group. And in Kopaka's fight with the Muaka, Templar cleverly decided to let Kopaka use Vakama's Mask of Invisibility, which allowed the animators at Templar to not only completely remove Kopaka's model from the scene, but also show direct weapon on Rahi combat without actually showing direct weapon on Rahi combat. It's genius. 
But even apart from the animated portions of Metanui Online, you could pick any single frame of the game and put it up in any art museum in the country. I know I already mentioned Miyazaki, but it's a good comparison. Like any of Miyazaki's films, each frame of Metanui Online's point-and-click locations is painterly and picturesque in its presentation, drawing the player not only further into the island, but further into the little details of each image. Every location begs for you to sit still and observe the world before you. And I think it was this beauty that helped the game stay fresh in the weeks between each chapter's release. The sound design, too, brings the world of Matsunui Online to life in ways that contemporary Flash games just didn't do. The wind through a canyon, the soft lapping of waves on the shore, all but completely immerse you in Templar's vision of Matanui. And alongside these awe-inspiring visuals was an incredible score from Justin Lutcher, a score that remains one of the most enduring pieces of Bionicle media, even though Templar's pitch for a physical CD release of the soundtrack fell on deaf ears. Much as the imagery of Templar's vision of Metanui evokes a certain sense of awe and wonder, so does the score, particularly one track that serves more or less as the main theme of Metanui Online, a track simply called Beach Chant where deep voices seem to resonate up from the earth itself in legato style. But even the other, less iconic music from the game still builds on the visible world of Metsunui in an organic and equally evocative way. So with these pieces in place, on January 1st, 2001, the first program of Templar's Metsunui online game was released onto Bionicle.com. Though the first wave of physical sets had already been released in Europe the month before, the Toa weren't set to land on the shore of the Americas until August of 2001, meaning Metanui Online Game would have to hold American fans' attention for the next eight months. The PC game, at least for now, was due out in September of 2001, ten months after Metanui Online would launch and two months after fans would finally have access to the physical sets. The first of the comics wouldn't be published until June of 2001, and the first book wouldn't hit store shelves until 2003. Matanui Online Game was it. The first chapter of Matanui Online was simple. A beach, a canister, a telescope, and some rocks. But that first image of an open canister washed up on the shore was so stunning, so captivating, that it's since become one of the most, if not the most, iconic image in the whole franchise. Unlike almost everything else in Metanui Online Game, this image was one of a handful that had already been developed by LEGO and Advance, with iterations of the canister appearing in various pieces of concept art from former Advance art and creative director Christian Faber as part of the design document that had been supplied to Templar months earlier. But the way Templar implemented Tahu's canister into Metanui Online is nothing short of perfect. In our emails, Max said that the image of the canister on the beach was of particular importance to the game that Matanui Online would end up being. Though the image was not of their creation, the weight of the image, which Mac called an emotive, non-specific, peaceful image to represent a narrative filled with conflict and adventure, pushed the team at Templar to make a world that matched that first enigmatic moment on the island. That image had affected the team at Templar, but even knowing their own feelings about it, none of them could have imagined just how profoundly their game would affect so many other people. The second of Metanui's programs launched on February 1st, 2001, the third on March 17th, the fourth on May 9th, the fifth on July 11th, and the sixth on August 18th, around the time the first physical sets began hitting store shelves in North America. And so as August transitioned into September, work began and continued on the 7th of Metanui Online's nine chapters. Now those of you who have been paying attention to the development timeline here may have already anticipated where the story goes next. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist act of proportions that we cannot begin to imagine at this juncture. On September 11, 2001, Templar Games, hours earlier deep in production crafting the snow-covered peaks of Metanui's Kowahi and Kokoro, and the homes of the then-silent Turaga Nuju and his translator Matoro, the latter of which was set to become a hero of his own storyline years later, watched from the roof of their offices in Manhattan's Lower East Side as fire and smoke billowed from the twin towers of the World Trade Center. 
The events of the September 11th terror attacks pushed the team at Templar further into the world they were creating. A rare case of video games becoming a form of escapism not just for those playing them, but also for those creating them. Max said that, as the world became bleaker and bleaker, and amid the chaos and fear of the September 11th attacks, it was somehow comforting that Program 7 took place among the peaceful snows of Kokoro and its silent existentialists. The war would come, but not until next month, in the real world as on Matanui. Now in the weeks that followed, winds from the south would hold the East Village captive in an odd-smelling fog, and Mac recalls several nights spent sleeping in the office as the team at Templar worked to complete Matanui Online's 7th program. Templar's office manager even brought toothbrushes and toothpaste to the office as overnight occupation of the office became the norm. Chapter 7 would launch on October 10th, around the time The Legend of Metanui would be formally cancelled by the LEGO Group. Legend's original release date of September had come and gone, and with the new December release looming, LEGO pulled the plug, leaving the weight of Bionicle's narrative advancement and conclusion squarely on the shoulders of Templar Games, and the still relatively new Bionicle comics, as helmed by writer Greg Farshty. Chapter 8 would release on November 17th, 2001, and now the endgame was in sight. But as Matanui Online was nearing its climactic end and armies of workers were still sifting through the rubble at Ground Zero, Templar found that their perspective on the classic good versus evil story had dramatically shifted. According to Mac, the final months of Matanui Online's narrative had been planned out since before the September 11th attacks. But in the months following, they found that the subtext of the story had shifted. Here's how Mac tells it. At the end, it was time to draw out the main theme that had been with us since the beginning. The story was about a battle, but between who? Violence for us had a different meaning. Good and evil just wasn't good enough anymore. It didn't make sense anymore. But this was okay, because from the beginning, that's not what it was about. The Makuta wasn't evil, and his brother Matanui wasn't good. We knew that while building was fun, it was just as much fun to destroy. They were two sides of the same coin. And neither were wrong, it was all part of the play, part of learning, part of having fun. Not good or evil, creation and destruction. Equal powers in the universe, natural and necessary. Both good, both bad, both neither. It's true, we'd painted destruction a bit negatively, using words like infected, mask, or monsters, but we needed that conflict. So the Makuta, for all its darkness and danger, was not evil after all, and he says as much at the end. The final act was the confrontation, not between good and evil, which was meaningless, but between creation and destruction, where everything comes from nothing, and goes back to it eventually. This was the struggle between the Toa and the Rahi, and Matanui and Makuta, and a Lego fan and her kid brother, building and smashing happily in equal measure. Our world had gone a bit mad, but to us this helped make some sense of it. We wanted to share what small comfort it brought. So Matanui Online Game continued to be a game not about what you'd expect. It wasn't about good and evil, and it, it didn't really have heroes. I mean, it did in a way, but not ones that you'd expect. The Bionicle comics were doing their job telling the tales of the Toa, so what was left for Templar? Who were the real heroes of their story? Well, in the end, it was the Matoran. Mac found it ironic that, both literally and metaphorically, the powerless little Matoran ended up being the heroes after all both to the island inhabitants of Matanui, and in a way, to the LEGO group itself. Mac elaborated on this idea. There was no story at all for the Matoran in 2001. They'd mapped out everything for Tahu and Gali and the others before handing it to Greg. But not us. While the real heroes, the ones with the big swords and the big price points, were out there saving the world, what were the Matoran doing? Just being saved? What they gave us at the beginning were the helpless, powerless, small, insignificant, without even a part in the main story except to be rescued from time to time. But sometime toward the end, we realized that's exactly what our audience was. The small, the powerless, those whose stories are yet to be written. Kids. And not just kids. Bionicle kids. So we pushed it further. The Toa were heroes. Takua was not, and nor were his friends. They were small and powerless, just like the kids playing. And maybe they weren't even the popular kids. So the band of Matoran you assemble isn't even the best and the brightest. It's not the Turaga's right hands, it's their lefts. The misfits. The weirdos. A Lakoran who can't fly. 
A Pokoran no one likes. A Kokoran that can't talk. When you go to get help, the Turaga don't give you their good people. What you get are the losers. And maybe there were more than a few Bionicle fans who identified with them. And we wanted to show that in the end, they could be heroes too. Now, that is more beautiful a message than any of us deserved from an early 2000s Flash game. The final chapter would launch on December 15th, 2001, and with it, solidify Matanui Online game as the Bionicle story of 2001. The success of Matanui Online amidst the greater story of Bionicle's early successes allowed Templar to continue their relationship with the LEGO group through a series of interstitial Bionicle animations for the 2002 Borok subplot and a Matanui Online sequel, The Final Chronicle, which followed the Mator and Hali on a more personal adventure across the landscape of Matanui. Templar's work on the Bionicle series would end with a series of animations for the 2004 storyline, military propaganda-style videos for Metru Nui's Vaki enforcers. Though that wouldn't stop Mac from flying across the Atlantic to pitch Lego on a Templar-helmed Bionicle PC game, though nothing ended up manifesting from that trip. So why have I gone on for so long about this Flash game from 2001? Well, there's a timelessness to Metanui Online game that can't be said for many Flash games of its era. And Metanui Online's legacy cannot be overstated. I mean, I'm here writing about it in 2020, 19 years after it came out. That's gotta count for something, right? I've even gone back and played it several times since its release, which is not something I can say for literally any other Flash game I've ever played in my lifetime. Metanui Online stands in a league of its own. And for whatever bits of Matanui Online's story LEGO tried to sweep under the rug in the years following its release, things like the Kokora and Turaga Nuju no longer being mute in subsequent Bionicle media, for fans like me it was THE story of Bionicle's earliest days. Bionicle was all my friends and I could talk about back then, and we'd constantly quote lines from the game to one another. Another Hafu original was a perennial favorite. And Mac thinks it was likely fans' love for the game that forced LEGO's hand in retroactively canonizing many of Matanui Online's story elements. Now, writing this script over the past few weeks honestly has felt like coming home to an old friend. And getting to hear these stories of the game's development from the developers themselves has been like looking through a family photo album I'd never seen before. Throughout our email exchanges, I couldn't help but gush to Peter here and there about my love and appreciation for the game that they made. And though I don't know how many emails like mine they've received in the years since Metanui Online first hit the web, its legacy is well known to them now, though it wasn't always that way. In 2001, Templar was just happy that LEGO was happy with the product. Fans seemed to be enjoying it, but the lasting impact was yet to be seen. Mac thinks that part of Metanui Online's longevity is that the game didn't pander to anyone. While it was a game expected to be played by kids, none of it was made for kids. The LEGO group had given Templar a lot of freedom in the creation of Matanui Online. Likely too much freedom in LEGO's mind, keeping in mind their attempted retcons of Templar's story elements, but it was that freedom, like it or not, that let Templar make the best game that they could. Well, if you've made it this far, it's probably because you're a big fan of Bionicle like me. So what's your favorite memory of Metanui Online game? Let us know in the comments. And if you haven't played Metanui Online in a while, or have never played it before, head on over to biomediaproject.com and play it for yourself. I promise you it's worth it.